Hi everyone, I'm Ram. Um, I'm going to talk about protocol aware recovery for consensus based storage. This is joint work with many others and our advisors, uh, Andrea and Rimsey. Redundancy enables distributed storage systems to tolerate failures. For example, a piece of data is redundantly stored on several servers and this provides fault tolerance. So even if a few servers crash or if they remain unreachable due to network failures, the system as a whole is unaffected and so the data stored by the system will be available and correct. However, in addition to system crashes and network partitions, sometimes the data stored on the individual replicas could be faulty. That is, they could be corrupted or they could remain inaccessible because of some underlying disk problems. We call such failures storage faults. So now let's talk about how to recover a piece of data that is affected by a storage fault in a distributed system. So let's start with a very simple example. This is a popular approach and a widely used one, um, which is to delete the data on the faulty node and just restart the node. Uh, this is popular, as you can see, in many developer forums. For example, in Zookeeper, uh, developers say on a file corruption, go ahead and clean the database, delete all the files, and just restart the node, and you'll be fine. So this seems sort of okay, so let's go ahead and try to apply this approach. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete the corrupted data on this faulty node and restart this node. And fortunately, in this particular case, the node is actually able to fix itself from the redundant copies in the other servers. So this approach seems intuitive, um, and it works, right? However, the same approach sometimes can lead to surprisingly a global data loss. The reason for this is, for example, take this case where the data was initially replicated to a bare majority of servers in the first place. Now one copy gets corrupted because of a disk problem. Now according to this approach, what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete this data and restart this node. Now at this point, it's possible that the nodes that have the data could be operating slowly or they could have even crashed. And it's furthermore, it's possible that the nodes that have no idea about the committed data in the system could form a majority and elect a leader among themselves. So we now have a majority of nodes in the cluster which do not have any idea about the system, which uh, in, the, in the system, and so it just means that the system has committed, lost the committed data, right? The, the core reason why this kind of approaches can lead to global data loss is that the approach is kind of oblivious to the underlying protocols used by the distributed system. In particular, the delete and rebuild approach that I showed you in the, previous, in the previous slide is oblivious to the protocol used by the system to update the replicated data. Thus, our proposal to correctly and quickly recover a piece of data in a distributed system is this. The recovery approach should be carefully designed based on the, uh, the protocols used by the distributed system. For example, it should be cognizant of the facts such as, is there a dedicated leader in the system? And what are the constraints on which nodes can become the leader and so on? We call such a recovery approach a protocol aware recovery approach. And in this work, we focus on a special cli class of distributed systems that we call replicated state machines or RSM systems. Examples include widely used systems such as Zookeeper. So we have implemented something called corruption tolerant replication, which is an implementation of a, a FAR a protocol aware recovery based approach for RSM systems. We have implemented control in two different RSM systems, Lock Cabin and Zookeeper. And through experiments, we see that control offers safety and high availability in the presence of storage faults, whereas the unmodified systems can lead to data loss or they can lead to unavailability. And further, these reliability improvements of uh, control come at no or little performance overheads. For example, when you run on uh, SSDs, um, for these reliability improvements, you, you uh, control imposes 4% overheads. So that was the introduction to the talk. And here is the outline for the rest of my talk. I'll first show uh, the current approaches to handling storage faults. Then I'll describe our approach. I'll show some evaluation results, finally summarize and conclude. So since we're going to talk about RSMs, here's a brief background. RSM is just a paradigm to make programs more reliable. The key idea is you take a program, run it on several servers at the same time. And if all these servers start at the same initial state and uh, apply the same sequence of inputs in the same order, then essentially they will all produce the same outputs. Now to ensure this, there is something called the consensus algorithm that runs as part of every replica. And typical implementations of uh, practical consensus protocols use something called the leader, which is a designated replica, which serializes all the requests from the clients and then takes this serialized input se uh, stream and then replicates to the leaders. And we say a command from a client um, is committed when it is accepted and persisted by a majority of servers in the system. And RSMs provide this property that the system continues to operate correctly and also remain available as long as a majority of uh, servers are functional. And because we are interested in dealing with storage corruptions, we need to carefully understand the different persistent structures that the RSM systems maintain. First, the incoming commands from the clients are stored in a data structure called the log. Uh, this is just a, uh, like a contiguous log that keeps growing and it is part of every node in the system. 
because the log could go um, and exhaust the disk space because you can keep appending to the log, periodically you would want to take a snapshot of the in-memory state machine and then garbage collect the log. That's the snapshot. And in addition to these main data structures, there is something called the meta info, which is very crucial and has vital information about, for example, voting and so on. Uh, it, this is kind of a small data structure that's part of every node. Now, all of these critical data structures could be affected by storage faults. And depending upon the file system that's in use, you could either get corruptions or it, you could get errors when you access these data structures. So with that, now let's talk about what are the current approaches to handling storage faults when the problems that I showed you in the previous slide arise. So what we do is we take practical systems, which are RSM systems, and inject these faults into these systems and observe how they behave. And we also analyze approaches that have been proposed by prior research to deal with data corruption in RSM-based systems. Through our analysis, we classify the approaches into two categories. The first category is what I call the protocol oblivious category. The approaches in this category do not use any level of uh, protocol, any protocol level knowledge, and so they can lose data or become unavailable. The second class kind of uses some protocol level knowledge, but they do so ineffectively or incorrectly, still leading to safety violations and unavailability. So to illustrate the different approaches, I'm going to walk you through a couple of them. Um, the first one is a simple approach that I call crash. In this approach, the um, node carefully uses checksums and handles IORS carefully, but the action that it takes upon detection is to crash itself. This is a popular approach. For example, it's used by Zookeeper. By crashing the node, you're um, not inflicting any harm in the system, but you're just affecting the availability. For example, if you have a five node cluster, you already have lost a couple of nodes because of, let's say, a partition or a system crash, and you're operating with a bare majority, and even a single data corruption in one node could lead to avail unavailability, because the first node would just like realize that there is a problem, it would crash itself. Note that restarting the node does not help in any way, because the, node, the, the problem that we're dealing with here is kind of persistent, it's a storage fault, and so the node would recover again, come back and hit the st same storage fault again, and then crash. So it'll remain in this crash restart loop, and if you want to take the node out of the crash restart loop, you need some sort of manual intervention, and that could be error prone, as I showed you, for example, the delete rebuild approach, right? Here is another, uh, another approach that is very interesting. Uh, we call this the truncate approach. In this approach, the node, instead of crashing the uh, node, it just realizes that there is something problematic. It truncates the faulty portion of the data and continues to operate. By doing so, the availability is kind of unaffected. But surprisingly, this could lead to a global data loss, even though you have several copies, other copies in other machines. For example, take this case. You have five machines. Three machines have agreed upon a set of commands. Now, the first, um, there is a corruption in the first entry in the first uh, machine. The machine realizes that. But what it does is it truncates that particular entry on all subsequent entries in the log, thereby losing the entire state. Now, it's possible that the remaining nodes, which do not have any idea about this committed data, could elect a leader among themselves, and so we could lose the data silently. So we studied all these kind of approaches, and, but I'm not going to describe all of them. Here's a summary of all the approaches. Uh, we saw that there are two different kinds. There are several approaches. And we are going to see how they are, is they are, are they safe, are they available, and what are the different kinds of properties they offer. For example, performance. Do they need manual intervention, or how fast they can recover, and so on. Here is the result of our analysis. Some key takeaways. First, we note that none of the approaches are both safe and available at the same time. Many approaches require some sort of manual intervention, and we know that such manual intervention can be error prone and can cause safety violations. Uh, finally, we note that none of the approaches can recover fast, even if they can recover at all. Right? In contrast, our approach, control, provides both safety and high availability, and it has a desirable property, such as it does not affect common case performance, it does not require manual intervention, and it can recover fast. So next, I'll describe control. Here is a very high level overview of control. It has two components. The first component is the local storage layer, which is responsible for managing the local data in each of the nodes and carefully detecting storage faults. The distributed recovery layer uses the redundant uh, copies on the other nodes to recover the faulty data that is informed by the local storage layer. Both these layers carefully exploit RSM specific knowledge to recover faulty data. So now let's talk about the local storage layer. The main function is to just detect the faulty data and detect which portions of data are faulty. To do this, the local storage layer uses well-known techniques such as checksums, proper error, IO error handling, and so on. And the local storage achieves these uh, goals by, with uh, low performance and space overheads. In addition to the above, there is an interesting problem that arises when you're dealing with checksum mismatches in the log. The core problem is that a checksum mismatch in the log could be due, due to two different reasons. One, system crash and two, a storage corruption. Let me illustrate this with a simple example. Let's say you have a log. 
You're trying to append something into the log, and then cr you crash in the middle. When you recover and come back, um, the entry would be partially written, which means that there would be a checksum mismatch. And the recovery here could just truncate the faulty entry, because we can be sure that the node could not have acknowledged any external entity, because it crashed in the middle of writing that update. On the other hand, consider this case, where the entries were safely persisted, but then a later disk corruption caused checksum mismatch for one of the entries. Here, we cannot truncate the entry as part of the recovery, because uh, that could cause us a global safety violation. However, current systems conflate these two conditions always, and they always uh, induce, uh, truncate the data in the presence of uh, corruptions in the log. Control modifies the local update protocol to um, enable the system to differentiate these two conditions. So next, now let's talk about the uh, distributed recovery part. And for this talk, I'm just going to concentrate on the log recovery. I'm not going to talk about the snapshot recovery or the meta info recovery. <clears throat> so first, as a first step, control simplifies the log recovery by decoupling the follower recovery from that of the leader. Fixing the followers is fairly straightforward because RSM protocols give, provide this guarantee that the leader is guaranteed to have all the committed data in the system. And that's a protocol level knowledge, an example of a protocol level knowledge that control exploits. For example, let's take this case. The followers are uh, having some corrupted entries in their logs. The followers could simply query their, about their faulty entries to the leader. And because we have this guarantee that the leader is guaranteed to have all the committed data in the system, the leader could simply, simply supply those values to the followers and fix them. And no matter what, how many faults are there in the followers, the leader can always fix them. That's the, fix, the tricky part in the uh, log recovery is fixing the leader's log. First, let's start with a simple case in which um, a faulty entry, uh, of an entry that is faulty in the leader is kind of intact on some other follower. For example, in this case, the third entry is kind of faulty in the leader. However, there are two copies which are intact on, on the followers. The leader could ask the followers, and the follower, one of them, could just supply the correct value. And once we have fixed the leader, we know it's straightforward to fix the followers. However, life is not always easy. Um, sometimes there are some cases where the leader logs cannot be fixed easily. For example, take this case. The leader has a corrupted entry. It could ask others, but no other, no other, system in, no other node in the system has any idea about this data. Or there could be some node which has some idea about this data, but it is currently partitioned or it has crashed. So you cannot recover the leader. So the main insight to recover from these kind of scenarios is that you have to separate committed items from uncommitted ones. While it is necessary to fix committed entries for safety, you could safely discard uncommitted entries. And doing so as early as possible is very vital to the availability of the system. So determine, to determine commitment, the leader queries for a faulty entry to all the nodes in the system. And let's say if a majority of the nodes come back and say that they do not have an entry in, this, in the log, then the leader can confirm that that entry must be an uncommitted entry. And so it can discard and continue from there. And so um, the system can remain available. On the other hand, if that entry were committed, then at least one node in any majority would have that entry. Because when we commit things, we commit at least to a majority of disks. And so the leader could fix using one of those correct, correct responses. And then, it can and then it can fix its log. And from there, it can proceed. There are several other corner cases that I'm not going to discuss in this talk. Uh, please read our paper for all these kind of recovery mechanisms that we have discussed in the paper. So next, I'll show, show some evaluation results. As I told you, I, we have implemented control in Log Cabin and Zookeeper, two different uh, systems based on two different consensus protocols. And we are going to explore the reliability guarantees of control and also the performance overheads that it, in, it induces. So first, I'll show you some reliability experiment, example of a reliability experiment. Uh, this is an example. So in this example, what we do is we take the log and the file system logs that make up the log. We inject errors into them, like, for example, introducing a corruption or an error. And the result is that in the original systems without control, uh, if you inject corruptions, they are unsafe in about 30% uh, of the cases that we tested or unavailable. And when you introduce errors, they are about uh, in half of the cases unavailable. In contrast, uh, in the presence of corruptions and errors, control always provides safety and high level availability. And that was one example. We also conducted many other similar experiments, uh, rigorous fault injection experiments. For example, all possible combinations of corruptions on all the entries. And um, like introducing crashes and lag, uh, network partitions so that the nodes could be lagging or they could have been crashed in addition to having data corruption. And also data corruptions in the snapshots, while some of the snapshots may be garbage collected, some may not be, and so on. We also introduced file system metadata faults, for example, corrupted I nodes or um, incomplete I nodes, and so on. And the, we inject these faults uh, at, like at a time at many nodes and so on. 
in all these reliability experiments, the summary is that the original systems were all um, safe, unsafe and unavailable in many, many cases, whereas the control versions always provided safety and high availability. Next, let, let's look at the uh, update performance overheads of control. So I'm going to show this uh, results for a simple workload, which is like in, uh, repeatedly inserting 1K entries into the system, and the snapshots are being taken in the background. And here are the results. On the left, we have the results for log cabin. On the right, we have it for Zookeeper. Um, on the y-axis, we have throughput, so higher is better. On the x-axis, we have different number of clients. As you can see, um, even for this write-intensive worst-case workloads, um, control introduces only 4% overheads on SSDs. And uh, on disks, it's uh, slightly higher, about 8 to 10%. And note that this is just uh, the overheads of control arise because for every uh, log entry that we write into the system, we write additional information, and that is the uh, source for the overheads. And note that this is the worst case overload, uh, overheads that control might have. Uh, this is because all for every write, we are paying some cost. So to summarize this talk, I showed you that recovering from storage faults uh, in distributed systems is surprisingly tricky. Uh, most existing recovery approaches are kind of protocol oblivious, and so they lead to problems. Uh, I showed you how protocol aware recovery approaches can be helpful, and I showed you one example of that, which is control, which is an implementation specific to RSM-based systems. It guarantees safety and high availability in the presence of storage faults at little performance overheads. More broadly, um, even seemingly obvious things that we take for gra granted from distributed systems, that such as like redundant copies will help recover from bad data, or more generally that redundancy enables reliability is kind of hard to, surprisingly hard to realize in uh, reality. And <coughs> I've, I've shown you how protocol awareness is a key idea uh, that can be used to effectively use redundancy to recover from storage faults. However, our step is just a first, uh, our work is just a first step in this direction, as many others have shown that there are similar problems existing in other classes of uh, systems. Uh, with that, I'll be, uh, I'll finish my talk. I'll be happy to take questions. Hi. Hey. Uh, great work. I, I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, first, does the leader give up leadership at some point? Oh, that's a great question. So, um, yes, it may. Uh, for example, the leader has a faulty entry. It may ask to others, and none of, it is not able to decide about that particular entry. Uh, in that case, after a timeout, the leader may step down, and it's possible some other node might get elected the leader this time, and then the system may be able to progress from there. Yeah, that's possible. Okay. And second question. So actually, the proper way to do this in Zookeeper would be to reconfigure the faulty node, and then to erase the log and restart it, and then reconfigure it again to include it back in the cluster. Did you compare with this approach? Oh, that's a great question. So we did uh, consider the reconfigure approach. Um, there are two problems with the reconfigure approach. Um, first of all, like uh, by reconfiguring, you are kind of like removing all the data from that node, and you're trying to rebuild that uh, node into a new node or a, uh, a node where you have deleted all the data. Now, if you have like a very large state machine, for example, file system as a state machine, then you have to rebuild the entire state instead of, let's say, you want to, like, don't, you don't want to amplify the error so much because you can mm -hmm. just like fix one file system block and you'll be fine. Yeah, so that's the, that's the uh, motivation why we think reconfigure is not so, not so ideal. And there are also other cases where reconfiguration can be unavailable, but that's kind of too tricky to explain in here. But the high level idea is that you need uh, to transfer too much amount of data to just to do that. Agreed, thank yeah, you. Thank you. Okay, then that's thanks the speakers. Yep.